sure. And good after, good evening, everybody. Um, so Katie Dykes here, Commissioner at Deep. Uh, really appreciate everyone uh, joining us this evening virtually uh, for this public forum uh, related to uh, Mexico State Forest. Um, many of us, uh, I know, had the opportunity to speak together uh, two Fridays ago. Um, I was appreciative of the opportunity to hear from many members of the community um, who had questions and concerns around uh, the management activities that have been um, underway. And we, uh, at that forum, uh, I, we uh, took down a lot of the questions um, that people were, were raising and uh, made a commitment to ensure that we were able to provide um, information back to everyone uh, who was interested about uh, an answer to those uh, many different questions that we received. And over uh, the last, uh, uh, you know, coming out of that um, that discussion, uh, we did uh, request that uh, the contractor who's working in the, in the site um, pause uh, the activity at that location to allow us time to uh, provide a response to the questions uh, that, that many folks were asking, um, as well as for our wildlife division staff um, to conduct some additional surveys um, at the location uh, to ensure that we had the best available information um, to respond to some of the questions uh, that folks had. And so um, we were appreciative of having that additional time. Um, uh, that activity has paused and, uh, and we're, uh, we sent an, a letter uh, this weekend. Hopefully that reached uh, many of you. Um, that included some detailed uh, responses to the, to the questions uh, that, that we heard at, at that meeting. And this tonight, this public forum is an opportunity for uh, you to hear from our deep staff who will be introduced in just a moment, uh, who have uh, been involved in the management, in the uh, administration of our forestry uh, program, um, as well as the wildlife division uh, to walk through the information uh, and, and the basis on which uh, we've been um, conducting our active forest management program at this state forest. And so we're pleased to have the opportunity to share this information uh, with everyone this evening. Um, I, we, uh, I know I've received uh, different letters and, and emails and um, expressions of concern uh, from, from folks who have a lot of different views about um, these issues and, and uh, the, the management of state forests. Um, I will say that uh, we have, <clears throat> while the, the activity on the site has been paused, uh, I, I want to clarify that DEEP has not canceled um, this contract. Uh, we are looking forward to the, the, the opportunity to provide uh, the information to all of you this evening uh, related to the management practices and the policy objectives um, that underlie uh, DEEP's commitment to active management of state forest lands, as well as the specific um, uh, characteristics and, and circumstances of, of this particular location, which we know is so important um, to the community in Simsbury and, uh, and important to us um, at DEEP as stewards of the state forest. So um, I appreciate everyone uh, joining us. I know it's a, um, you know, we're, we're doing this uh, remotely <laughs> via Zoom um, th that re reflects our, our practice um, at this time. We're uncertain about, you know, the, how many people we would have uh, joining and with the limitations on gatherings um, in large, large numbers uh, and just following our normal practice um, during the pandemic. Um, we're utilizing uh, this Zoom uh, forum, I think in light of the weather, uh, it's another uh, <laughs> um, uh, benefit of, of working online as well as ensuring that um, those with underlying health conditions or, or, or vulnerabilities um, are, are not uh, pre uh, prevented from being able to join us. But um, the, the forum is being recorded. I know that uh, we're, we're looking forward to uh, opportunities to engage with folks, hear questions or receive comments. And I know Rick will, will walk through that um, as well. So just welcome, um, thank you for, for joining us and uh, I will turn it back to you, Rick, uh, to introduce our team and, and talk a little bit more about what people will be learning this evening. Great, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, 
again, I too wanted to say welcome. I, I already did that, but I wanted to say it again, as I know we've had several more people join. Uh, we're approaching 100 uh, participants in this webinar at the moment, so that's great. Uh, first of all, why Zoom? Uh, as the commissioner has already mentioned in this period of pandemic, uh, we're first and foremost, wanna make certain that everyone is healthy and safe. Uh, both those in vulnerable communities as well as everyone else. And uh, we also want to adhere to the administration's guidance relative to outdoor events. Uh, second, I wanted to introduce the staff. You've already met uh, Commissioner Dykes. Thank you again, Commissioner. Uh, again, I am Rick Jacobson, Chief of the Bureau of Natural Resources. That includes fisheries, forestry, and wildlife. Also on the call from DEEP, we have Mandy Carruthers, our legislative liaison, works closely with Re Representative Hampton and Senator Whitcoast. Uh, Rebecca Foster uh, from our Office of Climate Change, she's our Director of Office of Climate Change. Chris Martin, the State Forester and Director of our Forestry Division. Jenny Dixon, our Director of Wildlife. And uh, Will Huckholzer, our Program Supervisor for State Lands Forestry Management, and Brian Hess, our Acting Supervisor for our Wildlife Diversity Program, which includes uh, surveying for and developing and implementing conservation strategies for rare and imperiled species. Uh, next up, um, the Commissioner has already mentioned that the purpose of this public virtual forum is to respond to the questions that were presented at the June 19th meeting, uh, provide you an additional opportunity to ask some questions and make comments. Uh, just to be clear that the Massico State Forest includes two dominant blocks. Uh, tonight, we're specifically talking about the Masako block, and that's the area of Masako State Forest adjacent to West Mountain Road. Uh, the primary purpose of the, fish, of the forest management plan is to increase the resilience of the forest and the ecological services it provides. That's our primary purpose for this forest cutting plan. Uh, second, we have a commitment as the commissioner has already made to active management of our forest lands to make sure that they're resilient in the face of a changing climate and that they provide for diverse uh, wildlife resources and ecological services for the public that uses them. Uh, the ground rules for tonight's virtual public forum is we've put everyone on mute just so we can manage with, again, approaching 100 people on this call, it would be pr pretty difficult to, uh, to manage questions or comments live. For purposes of questions, any and all questions you have, please enter them in through the chat box. Uh, if you ha need help understanding the chat box, at the bottom of your screen, in the middle of the screen, there's a little icon that says chat with a little cloud above it. Uh, if you tap on that, it's an, in it's an opportunity to offer your questions there. Jenny Dixon, the Director of Wildlife, will be monitoring those questions. If there is a question asked that's germane to the specific topic we're covering at that time, we can entertain it then. Otherwise, we have a period for questions and answers at the end of the, at the, end of the webinar. That's also the great place to enter your comments. Uh, as Commissioner Dykes mentioned, this entire virtual public forum is being recorded. That's both the live portion and all of those items that are included in the chat box. So your comments will be recorded and uh, for the record and available for viewing after this. I wanna be clear, we had a hard start time of 6.30 to be considerate to all those who wish to participate, but we also have a hard stop time of 8 p.m. Uh, that hard stop time is just out of respect for everyone that signed on to this so you don't feel like you're in this ever ending, never ending meeting. And the last of our ground rules is, please be respectful of others. It's fine to be hard on issues, but not on people. So we ask whether it's in your questions or in your comments in the chat box that you're hard on issues, but not on people. With that, we'll move right into the questions that we under, as we understood them from um, the June 19th meeting. 
Uh, the first was relative to communications and public input, both on the forest management plan for the Masako State Forest, as well as the cutting plan for the Masako Block. The draft, first of all, we do 10-year management plans for all of our state forests, and we do not do a cutting on any of our state forests unless there's a 10-year management plan in place. For the Masako State Forest, we have a 10-year management plan that extends from 2014 to 2024. That draft plan was provided to the Town of Simsbury Conservation Commission, the Simsbury Land Trust, and the Friends of Goodwin uh, group for comment and presentation back in 2013. Uh, so that was where the opportunity was to comment on the overall plan for the entirety of the Masako State Forest Management Plan. Uh, since then, oh, oh, at that time, we received comments from the Simsbury Land Trust, and those are found in Appendix C of the Masako Management Plan. Reference was also made to the Farmington Valley Biodiversity Project and to concerns raised specifically by Bill Moorhead, a consultant, consulting botanist, about rare plants along part of the shore of the pond at Great Pond. Remembering, Great, there's the Great Pond block, which is about four and a half miles away from the Masako block, the subject of this particular cutting plan. So Bill Moorhead's comments relative to rare plants were relative to the Great Pond block, not the Masako block. Uh, then there was correspondence uh, via phone and email that occurred during January of 2018. Uh, that was with the assistant town manager, Mike Glidden, offering a presentation similar to the one conducted for forestry thinning work at the Great Pond Block, and Jeff Shea with the town engineer. I mentioned those because those were the more recent and those were specific to a temporary access relative to the West Mountain Road block. So there was consultation with representatives from the town in 2018. Relative to question number two, and that's the Masako management plan also, um, the, the management plan covers, as I just said, both the Great Pond block as well as the Masako block off West Mountain Road, as shown in the maps uh, within the forest management plan. All references to stand number 20 to the Masako block as indicated on these maps. So we're specifically talking about forest management practices tonight on stand 20 in the Masako block off of West Mountain Road. To give you some context, the Masako block overall is 122 acres. And sale W424 will occur over 20 or 81 acres of that 122 acres in the Masako block. Question three was on the economic benefits of the project. Well, revenue is an ancillary benefit and a byproduct of the silviculture work prescribed. Revenue itself does not influence the decisions we make re regarding improved forest health recommendations. That's within the, within the Masako Forest Management Plan or any forest treatments prescribed across deep lands. Bottom line is the economic benefits delivered by these forest management plans and the, for, the silviculture activities prescribed under those management plans are specifically designed for the ecological services provided. And what do I mean by ecological services? I mean the services, ecological services, both to people using the forest, as well as to the wildlife that are dependent upon those forests as well. But the question doesn't end there. It went on to another question on the timber sale revenue. Well, there are, there are typically revenues generated from a timber sale on one of our silviculture prescriptions. Revenue, any revenues that are derived from those prescriptions are reinvested into state lands management program. So any revenues generated from this Masako forest harvest is directly reinvested into how we manage those forested lands. 
and that includes uh, any prescriptions that happen on state forests or wildlife management areas. Those monies can be used for the development of forest management plans, for resolving boundary line issues, for road culvert or bridge maintenance and replacement, for removing hazard trees, for controlling invasive species, for purchasing forestry equipment and hiring seasonal support staff to assist with all of these activities. So again, any revenues generated are turned back into managing these state forest lands to make sure they're resilient in the face of things like climate change and they produce the ecological services we all enjoy. Relative to this specific sale, W424, that, that sale sold for a revenue generated back to the state was $21,040. And that's in addition to other things that are required of the contractor. For instance, the contractor is constrained in when he can complete that, that harvest. It has to happen only under dry conditions or frozen ground conditions. That's to minimize any soil disturbance it's to minimize any soil uh, sediment runoff. It's to make sure that the, the footprint left by the contractor doing the work is the minimized to the greatest degree possible. It's also used, there's also a requirement on the contractor to provide and spread with a bulldozer so close to 200 tons of stone over 200 feet of geotextile fabric, which creates the foundation for the roadbed for moving all the material and equipment, et cetera, to ensure that uh, there is no damage to the forest floor. In question number six, the specific objectives of the sale of W424, that contract. Well, the specific objectives were to create an uneven aged forest with greater vertical diversity and varied tree ages. Removals favor scarlet and black oak to retain red and white oak. Improved spacing and small openings will encourage red and white oak germination. And there is a focused effort to reduce red maple and black birch. Red maple and black birch are species uh, that are non-mass producing, means less food for wildlife. They're shorter lived and prolific regenerating tree species that inhibit the establishment of desired long-lived mass producing species like um, uh, red and white oak. Also an objective of the project is to retain cavity trees and when safe, occasional dead standing trees will be incorporated to provide and enhance wildlife habitat values. Uh, think of all those dead and standing tree burrowing species that benefit from additional dead and standing trees. It's also noted that the contractor is constrained. The contractor may only take trees that have been marked and approved by professional state lands foresters. And those foresters are marking only those trees that are necessary to meet the objectives of the plan, to enhance the age and structural diversity and to improve wildlife habitat. Relative to the question of greenhouse gases, well, number one, maintaining deep property as open space is a climate solution for our state. Maintaining open space property on private lands is also a, a climate solution. Our approach ensures in the context of deep managed properties that land remains forested and other potential uses for the property do not contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. In that context, DEEP is actively managing this forest to keep it healthy for wildlife and for a diversity of tree species. Doing so is part of our commitment to keep our forest growing strong. This project at Masako is not about promoting logging. It's about managing the forest's health. We are continuing to review the best available science on how forests remove and store atmospheric carbon. We think of our, our management approach promotes both sequestration in new growth and storage in retained mature trees and Masako State Forest. Remembering there's the two paradigms in the context of climate change and forest management. There's carbon sequestration, 
which is maximized in young growing forests. And then there's carbon storage, which as we retain mature trees, we'll retain that storage. And those trees that are harvested and converted to long-term wood products will also store that carbon in, indefinitely. A question came up by what do we mean by adaptive forest management as it appears in the forest management plan? Well, adaptive forest management ad addresses instances that we didn't anticipate when we developed the forest management plan in 2014. It addresses instances when unexpected events or conditions arise over a planning period that were unanticipated at the time the forest management plan approval. These events and or conditions may require immediate action to address forest health or public safety concerns. Examples of un unanticipated events or conditions include insect or disease outbreaks, significant tree damaging weather events, and other events that significantly change forest health such as drought or fire. We've had some very dramatic um, instances of significant events that have changed dramatically in a very short period of time what our forests look like. Think of the major windstorms that demolished all of the trees down at um, uh, in Wallingford or the significant drought coupled with gypsy moths that decimated much of our oak forests in Patchogue State Forest in Eastern Connecticut or the cause of the loss of so many ash trees through the emerald ash borer. Those are things that have happened quickly and that we need to adapt to and that's the purpose behind adaptive forest management. Question number nine was to assess or access of, ac blah, blah, blah. sorry, I apologize for that. Question nine was one on how does one access our management plans? Well, all of our current deep forest management plans and all of our future plans are or will be available online at a, the location displayed on your screen. That's https double slash portal dot ct dot gov deep forestry management on state lands, you get the picture. If you can't, don't get a chance to copy this or you don't wanna go back and, and uh, go to the recorded session to capture that, you can do a Google search on Connecticut deep forest management state lands and you should be able to find our state forest management plans. Uh, Deep post those managements to share the agency strategies and goals with the public and to initiate dialogue with all interested groups. We want to hear from everyone. Question number 10, and that's where we started to get into questions about what are the implications of this harvest on wildlife, particularly in this case on nesting wildlife. Well, there may be disturbance to some species currently nesting, but the overall impact of this forest management activity on wildlife will be beneficial. That's the purpose for doing the project in the first place or one of the multiple, pro uh, multiple objectives. Food resources will increase from the regenerating vegetation. Increased invertebrate numbers will also come of it and increased mass massed from the retained trees, again, the red and white oaks, which are the dominant mass producing trees that support so many of our wildlife. Additional habitat will be provided by retaining standing dead trees, as I mentioned earlier, and increasing the vertical structure. Now, in terms of nesting birds specifically, because that's what this question was about, the vast majority of birds have already finished their first nesting attempts and all are expected to have finished their first attempts by mid-July, just two short weeks away. And we do anticipate that all nesting will be completed by mid-August. Our challenge is to delay and limit the impacts to nesting birds and balance those against the impacts to other wildlife. And we'll be speaking about that again in just a moment. Another question came up about the relative impacts to wildlife corridors. Well, there are uh, regional plans, those plans that are developed by organizations like with the Wildlands Network, the Nature Conservancy, the Nature's Network, and others, do not 
identify the Masako block as a significant wildlife corridor. Now, having said that, that doesn't mean it's an insignificant resource either. Rather, the Farmington Vallow by Valley Biodiversity Report identifies the Masako Block as part of a secondary conservation area, and it is a local connection to other conservation areas. So it's not that it's unimportant, it's just not one of the significant corridors that are identified in those plans by these various uh, regional and national organizations. But all that said, active forest management is compatible with maintaining connectivity. In fact, it is an important tool for sustaining the integrity of ecological connections and is a critical part of responsible stewardship. This site will continue to be open space and a useful connection. Questions about how corridors are designated? If you still have questions about how corridors are designated, please use the chat box and we'll, we'll try to answer your questions. There was another question relative to the Natural Diversity Database Review. Well, a Natural Diversity Database, and that database is the repository for information from citizen scientists, uh, academic researchers, state biologists, state foresters, and a host of other sources to identify where on the landscape various rare and imperiled species are located. Specifically, the Natural Diversity Database focuses on those species that are listed under the Connecticut Endangered Species Act as endangered, threatened, or species of special concern. And they're in that order. Endangered certainly are the most um, threatened, if you are most endangered. <laughs> uh, threatened are a tier below that. And special concern are those that are neither endangered or threatened at this point, but we recognize they are a watch species because they may be a declining population across the state. Um, and we just want to be cautious that they don't fall into the endangered or threatened category. So that's what the Natural Diversity Database is. When we develop a forest management plan and subsequent uh, silviculture practices under that plan, we conduct a natural diversity database review. Uh, natural diversity database maps are frequently updated to include the most up-to-date information from a variety of sources. For the Masako block, uh, that review was done in 2013 when the 10-year management plan was first developed. And it was also done in 2018 when um, the contract was first considered or when the, the, the bid specifications for the contract were first considered and none of no endangered threatened or species of special concern were identified. Most recent natural diversity database December of 2019 shows no known occurrences of state listed species either. In addition to the natural diversity database biologists from the wildlife division and fisheries division provided comments during the process developing the Masako Forest Management Plan and W424. We wanted to do all we could at that level to ensure that any uh, operations undertaken or any silviculture activities undertaken under W424 were done sensitive to listed species. Well, that spun into what have we done more recently? If all we did was review the natural diversity database maps, shouldn't we have done a survey? Well, during this period of pause that the commissioner uh, referenced, we have assigned our staff biologists to conduct surveys for birds, reptiles, amphibians, and plants across the Masako block as recently as last week. And I should say they also surveyed the area relative to vernal pools, looking for remnants of pools that may have existed in the spring relative to other landscape features. For birds, they did not, they uh, used 19 points were visited on two mornings between 4.45 a.m. and 8.30 a.m. The surveyor remained at each point for five minutes, recording all species heard or seen at each location. That's a standard surveying technique for bird surveys. For reptiles and amphibians, biologists walk standardized transects on three days. The transects were designed to sample suitable habitat throughout the site. 
Survey times for transects were varied to maximize the potential to encounter species with different behaviors and thermal needs. Again, these surveys too were done to standards of biological sampling for reptiles and amphibians. Plant surveys too were consistent with consistent um, standard practices uh, with several uh, thorough walkthroughs of wetlands on site with effort made to record each plant species found with the, with the exception of grasses and sedges. If you want more, if you would like more information about that survey, a detailed survey report is available on our DEEP website. Again, if you do a Google search on Connecticut DEEP, Forest Management Plans, Masako Wildlife Findings, you'll find that report. It's available for all. Uh, an extension on that question was um, during those surveys, we did find one anomaly, and that was an eastern box turtle was found on the site. Eastern box turtles are listed as special concern under the Connecticut Endangered Species Act. They're, they're relatively common across the state, so it makes it no big surprise. In fact, my dog found one just uh, last week on a piece of private land in East Hampton, Connecticut. Um, but they are of a declining species, and it's, so it's something we wanted under watch, and hence it was listed as a species of special concern. To minimize impacts to box turtles, daily sweeps are conducted to remove uh, uh, during forest management operations. Daily sweeps are conducted to remove turtles from the immediate work area. Forest management takes place during the summer and early fall when turtles can be safely moved out of the way. Management activities in the fall or winter risk injuring or unearthing hibernating turtles that won't be able to move to a new overwintering spot. Again, that's why we focus on summer and early fall periods. Eastern box turtles use a variety of habitats and will benefit from increased successional forest. In other words, thicker understory and more sunny spots within the site and greater structural diversity within the forest. More diverse forests are beneficial to this species. A question was also raised relative to the American climbing fern. Those results will be presented in a moment. A question was raised relative to forest product utilization. Well, contractors that sign timber sale agreements with the state are required to cut only those trees marked and approved for removal by state foresters to accomplish the silver culture objectives of the forest stand. Fortunately, forest products have monetary value that allows the buyer to offset operational expenses. It doesn't cost us money to do those. It generates a small amount of revenue that we turn back into state forest management. The contract will market various forest products to local regional primary forest product companies. These, product, these companies produce a variety of wood-based products such as flooring, furniture, and pallets, uh, many of which represent long-term carbon storage opportunities. Deep does not track where the purchased wood is sold after it leaves deep, just to be clear. Many Connecticut primary wood processors also participate in the Department of Agriculture's Connecticut Grown Program. If you'd like more information about that, you can Google Connecticut Forestry, Connecticut Grown Forest Products. The next question, Waves, was about public access during the harvest. Yes, we ask for visitor safety that they stay at least 500 feet from workers. Forest thinning is restricted to 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. weekdays. No work is to be performed on weekends. Now that said, and, and I should add, deep foresters post signage on all active work sites to inform the public of the activity and provide contact information to answer any questions or address concerns. Now that said, staying 500 feet from workers on an 81 acre is easy to do on an 81 acre forest cut and still utilize the forest. So visitors may continue to use the forest, just stay 500 feet from workers while they're in the act of uh, executing the forest harvest. 
Uh, the next question was relative to invasive species control. Uh, deep foresters monitor forest stands to be certain that silviculture objectives were met. Now they monitor these forest stands before silviculture activities are undertaken, just and that's what leads them to conclude what silviculture ob objectives to uh, pursue. But they also manage them after the fact because we want to make certain what we were striving to achieve, we achieve. During those monitoring activities, if invasive plant species are detected, and threaten the success of the treatment, an invasive control plan is implemented. At that time, we rely on funds in our timber uh, revolving account, the account into which that $21,040 is deposited to implement an invasive control plan to ensure that invasive species are, are in fact controlled. The next question was about a questionable boundary line that's located outside the work area along the old railroad right of way. There are approximately 20,200 or three and a half miles of boundary along the old railroad right of way within Masako's block. The location of this line is unknown and will require survey. Once again, we rely on any funds that are deposited into the timber revolving account to be used for boundary surveys to ensure that we know where the state forest boundary and other property owners' uh, rights lie. Next up was a question about vernal pools. Uh, Connecticut state lands foresters are trained in the identification of vernal pools and wetland features, and they map such features as a matter of standard practice during preparation of each forest management plan. Vernal pools are also recorded and mapped if they are associated with rare species and key amphibian concentration areas. A vernal pool is identified on the harvest map and non-cut buffers or no cut areas are defined have been left around vernal pools and wet soil areas on the site. So again, I wanna be clear where there have been wet soils identified and where vernal pools have been identified on the Masako block a buffer around those have been defined and there's no cut areas within those buffers or within the vernal pools or wet soil areas. In addition to the standing vernal pool in the center of the property and the wet area in the northwest corner, an uncut buffer has been left in the wet soil south of the vernal pool. Climbing fern. Uh, this is a plant that's listed as special concern on the state endangered species list. It likes moist open woods and thickets with acidic soils. It was documented in the Great Pond Block in 2005, but it has not been located in the Masako Block. Plant surveys that were performed during the Natural Resource Inventory on June 23rd and 24th uh, just last week. Uh, those surveys consisted of a thorough walkthrough of the wetlands on the site, as I indicated before. A special effort was made to locate climbing fern, though it was not found. Finally, what's our path forward? Our path forward for this project, as the commissioner indicated, is that the work is currently paused and that the first nesting of nesting birds in the area is complete or nearly complete and that we wish for the work to be completed during the dry season. Once the work is resumed there will be daily sweeps for eastern box turtle starting uh, with the beginning of each workday moving turtles found out of the work area. The future uh, that's item number one. Item number two is the future of public outreach for forest management change. Let me step back from that a second. So the next item on our path forward is the future of public outreach for forest management. We are committed to changing our best management practices relative to public engagement. Well, our staff are working on those new protocols now and they'll be ready to roll out later this year. And the last is policy involvement. We have two major initiatives. One is the Governor's Council on Climate Change, otherwise known as the GC3. And within the Governor's Council on Climate Change, there are several work groups. One of those work groups is the Working in Natural Lands work group, and a subset of it is the forest subgroup. 
Within the forest subgroup, we're specifically looking at how to manage forests, both on state and private lands, in urban and suburban communities into the future to both mitigate for climate change impacts and to adapt those resources to continue to provide the ecological services that we've all come to expect from our state and private land forests. If you wish to become involved in the Governor's Council on Climate Change in general, in the Working and Natural Lands Working Group specifically, or even more specifically in the forests subgroup, I encourage you to go to, uh, again, the DEEP website at DEEP Climate Change GC3 Subcommittee and Working Groups. You can do a Google search on it as well. It should take you to that site. The other major opportunity for public engagement is forest action planning. We're in the throes of developing our next forest action plan for the state of Connecticut. Uh, we are, originally that was due to be submitted to the US Forest Service at the beginning of July with the COVID issues being what they are. That's been pushed back to the end of the year, which gives us additional time for public input. If you would like to provide additional input into our forest action planning, which will set the stage for our statewide approach to forest management into the future, I encourage you to go to the DEEP website, Forestry of Forest Assessment. Again, Google search it. And that's the end of the presentation. I've asked Jenny Dixon to monitor the chat box for questions. Uh, Jenny, at this point, are you prepared? Well, first of all, um, I will ask uh, Senator Whitkos, do you have any comments or questions that you would like to put forward? Thank you, Rick. Um, pleasure to be here with everybody this evening. I think you answered all the questions that were presented out in the field um, uh, in a very informative manner. And I, I've been watching the chat box and there's a, a ton more, so I'm gonna be quiet and uh, not take up any time so we can get some more answers to those questions, but thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Hampton. Uh, very well. Uh, in that case, Jenny, are you prepared to present some of the questions that were raised in the chat box? Yes, Rick, I can do that. Or I also posted some of the questions for you in the chat box directly. So if you just want to read the messages I sent to you, you can probably read the questions and then get the answers. Uh, let me move my cursor around. I'm a little concerned that people are tired of listening to me, but I'll give it a shot. Uh, from I only say that because we're getting intense thunderstorms in my part of the state right now, and so you're going to hear lots of thunder and lightning in the background if I try and read them to you. Ah, uh, gotcha. They're in the chat box, you said. Yep, uh, they show up as... I as questions from me to you. Oh, uh, all right. I, I'm, so I don't take up everyone's time. I'm going to ask you just to go through them because I uh, it's going to take me too long to figure that out. Can you just present the first question? Hello. Hello. Jenny? Hello, Jenny. Um, Hello. There was. There was a question, Rick, about how invasive species are going to be treated. Hello. Well, uh, well, first of all, uh, we don't know that there will be invasive species. We will be monitoring to ensure or to, 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 to see whether or not invasive species do undermine the objectives of the harvest in the first place. But assuming there are, I'm going to turn to uh, either Chris Martin or Will Huckles are in our approach to treating invasive species. Sure, Rick. Uh, thank you. Um, and that's a that's a very valid question. Um, we currently uh, watch for and treat invasive species in other areas of the state forest. And it's, it's of course, easiest to do that um, at the very beginning when they first appear. Uh, this particular area of Massico uh, Asako has not had any um, invasive species in the operating area. Uh, usually when we see invasive species, it comes in from adjoining properties 
uh, residential areas uh, reverting farm fields and that what that much so but we'll continue to watch this location uh, we don't anticipate the activity itself will introduce invasive species in fact it'll encourage um, lower growth native species that will uh, overcome and uh, crowd out invasives very good thank you chris uh, next question jenny the next question is for rebecca and it, it she's probably the best one to answer this can DEP comment on Mark Anderson from TNC's report, Wild Carbon, that states wild forests can exceed carbon storage of managed forests? How can we thin given the importance of sequestering carbon? Hi, uh, this is Rebecca French. I, I have not read that particular uh, report, um, but uh, yeah, the, I was just about to post into the chat box that we've been having really active discussions in the forest subgroup where we've had multiple presenters and experts, I think, including uh, experts from TNC talking about carbon sequestration and soil carbon and storage in forests. So all of that work is going to informing DEP and our, our forest management. Next Thank question, you. Jenny. Yep. Folks wanted to know what's unhealthy about this forest. I think we need to maybe explain a little bit more about what those statements were, because I think it was a little confusing when it was conveyed. Chris? Sure. So um, when we do an inventory of the forest, we count the trees, we, we take the relative stocking, and we look at the general health of the forest. And is it growing well? Um, what's the future of the forest? And in this particular case, uh, the forest inventory did show that the stocking was very, very heavy. There was very little new growth coming in underneath the forest, and therefore there was a need to get some more diversity. Um, and so by taking out the shorter lived species, as Rick mentioned, um, black scarlet oak, red maple, uh, we're allowing that forest to breathe, um, very similar to a garden uh, in some sense where you just need a little more space for the trees to flourish. Otherwise what happens is the trees slow down, they're all competing for the same nutrients and water in the soil and you'll get uh, trees weakened and more susceptible to not only invasive species but native issues too. Okay. Thank you Chris. I think, I think the next question is for you as well. Why does it make more sense to log Massico forest and plant pines than to log people's state forest and plant oaks? Do you need me to repeat that? Chris? Well, I think this was one point that um, has caused some confusion. Uh, for some, several folks in that there's two separate blocks of the forest and one uh, where pine uh, and, and James Goodwood really worked hard to uh, foster pine and that was in the great pond block and then this location uh, which is an oak lot and the soil types and the forest type uh, are favorable to oak in particular we want to see more red and white oak so we're not encouraging pine in this location we're not planting pine um, and if we folks look closely at the forest management plan, uh, work that's scheduled in there that relates to stand number 20 is what we're, what we're doing here off West Mountain Road. Uh, there's lots of work scheduled in the plan, uh, but it's all listed by stand number, by area within the forest. And the pine work is in that other block four and a half miles away. Okay, the next question is, is DEP saying that only managed forests are healthy? Have there been any comparative studies of our actively managed and unmanaged state forests? So we constantly monitor our state forests for growth and mortality. And I can tell you that we have areas um, over half the state forest system doesn't see management, doesn't have a current forest management plan. Not to say that it may or may not in the future, but what we are finding is a lot of forest health issues throughout the state forests. And in Western Connecticut, uh, it's emerald ash borer, 
and the thinning of ash trees, which is actually allowing invasive species to get a foothold because of the filtered sunlight. And then in Eastern Connecticut and in spots of Western Connecticut, but to a lesser extent, was the um, aftermath of drought and several consecutive years of gypsy moth. Again, um, without intervention, uh, any endangered or any invasive species that are established um, get a foothold and outcompete native vegetation. In addition to that, there's been considerable public safety concerns in our parks, along our roads, uh, picnic grounds, and it's reflective of areas that we that require work in order to keep the forest healthy. Okay, the next question is how big are the no cut buffers around pools? They've seen trees that are marked for cutting within 20 feet of the pond. So I, I guess we'd have to get more specifics on location. Um, I wonder if it's the Great Pond area that um, that they're referring to, or actually there was some recommendations on daylighting uh, in the plan around Great Pond to encourage some of the more rare plant species. But um, if we can maybe offline get more information on that, there shouldn't be anything marked within 20 feet of a of a pond. There is no ponds on this block. There was a question about whether or not an operational plan was prepared. Yes, all our all our timber harvests and forest management plans that act, actively change the vegetation, improve the vegetation, do have an operational plan. And that plan is vetted through the wildlife and fisheries and parks folks, as well as um, Connecticut Forest and Park Association if there's a blue trail in there. And that uh, that actually enables us to have additional communications more specific to the operation on the ground. How does DEP utilize Connecticut owned parks and forests to contribute scientific communities in forestry and other science? To contribute to scientific communities in forestry and other science? Well, I'll take part of this, Jenny, but you may want to pick up some of it. So we, um, and I don't know the number, but um, through our special use license program, we issue scientific collector's permits. Um, and I couldn't tell you the number, but there are dozens annually. And whether it be to the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, um, graduate students or other interested parties, citizen science, um, we encourage that. It's actually a goal of this forest, uh, specifically as, as the bequested wishes of James Goodwin are. So it's a fairly common, fairly common uh, activity and one that we encourage. And I would certainly say that many of our both forest and park lands are also the subject of a lot of wildlife research that's not only done by the agency, but done by a lot of other conservation groups as well. The next question, Chris, is, um, shoot, hang on, I just lost it. One moment, please. Scrolling, scrolling. How would you define a resilient forest and what do you look for to exemplify that resilience? So we look at resiliency as um, the ability to recover uh, from a natural disaster or a fire, um, drought, insect disease. And one of the key features of that is diversity of age and diversity of tree species. And picking trees that will sustain or um, be able to withstand adverse weather conditions. Uh, and part of that is proper growing space, um, trees that are stronger as far as limbs and wood quality goes. And then also uh, understory and replacement forests, because we haven't had a replacement forest wind event statewide in, since the 1938 hurricane, but there are events that are sporadically happening throughout Connecticut that really just topple the overstory. And to have nothing underneath to replace that forest immediately is a great concern of ours. Hello. 
I'll take the next one, Chris. There was a question well, about- Well, just let's, um, someone has asked to say hello. And I'm just curious who that might be. Hi, it's State Representative John Hampton. Oh, yes, please. Okay, and we've been, uh, just for everyone else's benefit, we've been texting back and forth trying to figure out how to get you on. So our greatest apologies, but the floor is yours, sir. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so sorry. I'm having uh, problems with Zoom issues, but I've been on the call since the beginning, and I'm happy to be on the call with Kevin Whitkos, Senator Whitkos. And I want to thank um, the commissioner and uh, you, Mr. Martin, and all your staff um, for uh, hosting um, this forum and um, the visit that we had um, a week or so ago. Um, I just do want to, though, um, make my position known that I stand in, in strong opposition to any further logging on this site in the uh, context of our global climate change and our climate crisis, um, and that this is a, a precious, uh, precious forest to our uh, our community and a wild, special wildlife corridor that we must preserve and protect uh, for future generations and to protect the wildlife and uh, natural resources that are there. So while I appreciate um, all that's been stated tonight, um, my, my uh, uh, opposition will remain steadfast and hoping that we can um, work out some sort of agreement that this parcel becomes uh, maybe a study area, um, a recreational area, uh, but preserved um, in purpose in perpetuity so um but i do want to thank you for engaging um the public and hopefully moving forward this process i think can be more transparent and that i and senator whitkos and other town leaders uh, would have been maybe notified sooner um but uh moving forward um i will be uh maintaining my my position but thank you for letting me speak well, thank you well, thank you, you representative <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Oh, no worries. Uh, Jenny? Sure. The next question is about the climbing fern or the Hartford fern. There was a question about the plan stating that it was found in the Masako block. We searched the Masako block for it and did not find it. Our records had indicated it was actually in the Great Pond Block, and one of our staff members did find it back in 2005, but we've been able to, to relocate it either in that original location or in the surveys that were conducted last week. There was also another question about, um, or statement that somebody had seen the logger working and there hadn't been any search for box turtles before they started to cut. I suspect that that occurred because that was at the beginning of the cut when we as yet did not know that box turtles were in that area. The box turtles were found after we had paused the operation. So it's part of that adaptive management process that both Rick and Chris talked about a little bit earlier. As we learn new things, we change what the protocols and operating procedures are to adjust to those changes. So moving forward, that would be something that would be required of the contractor. There was also a question about who's over, who is responsible for overseeing the contractor. Apparently someone noticed that three large trees had been cut that didn't have any blue markings on them. So um, that, is, that is curious. I would want to see those trees. Sometimes when the, the act of moving the trees, um, those marks get scuffed off. One of the things that foresters do, though, is mark very low on the stump, um, below any ability to remove the wood. So when a tree is cut, you're left with a stump, and there's, there's a paint mark at the base of that tree, and that provides us assurance that if a tree was indeed cut, um, it, was, it was authorized to do so. Um, also, on occasion, in creating a landing, um, the forester will designate a small area where trees can be removed. And they may or may not be all marked in that area where we anticipate a clearing so for the work to be done. Rebecca, I know you answered this question already, but I'm gonna read it again and, and you can perhaps elaborate on this a little bit because I know there are some folks who may not be able to see this in the chat box, but there was a question about when the GC3 groups report back to Governor Lamont in 2021, 
Do we believe they will support intensive logging of healthy land? Um, well, I don't want to comment on what the, the governor's council, you know, will um, support. I don't, I, uh, but I would point uh, anyone interested on this call to uh, join the um, subgroup meetings of the forestry subgroup will be putting forward recommendations uh, to the governor's council and informing their deliberations. And uh, I understand that report talks about, um, talks about management, talks about sequestration and the value of forests. And I encourage everyone to get involved in that process. I'll just um, I'll add that you know deliberations uh, with the GC uh, forest subgroup, which I'm staff assigned for assistance, um, have not recommended uh, intensive logging um, as a solution to climate change. Uh, what it has, and it's all in draft and still being worked on, it has encouraged sustainable management. It has encouraged longer rotations. Um, it has encouraged. Uh, re reserve areas and the group is continuing to, um, you know, uh, share different scientific documents that stole the virtues of all three of those items. And I, and probably at the end of the day, and it's it maybe premature, but we would expect to see a recommendation of a mix of use on forest lands. Um, intensive logging, um, you know, the connotation is that it's, it's harmful, uh, but I would say that, that how you phrase it, how you look at it, um, you know, we have species of uh, great concern, such as the box turtle and uh, endangered and threatened species that require young forest habitat. Uh, and one way to get there is through removal of some of the forest to um, accomplish those goals. So although, you know, one size definitely fit doesn't fit all, um, we do look at a, a variety of approaches to not only uh, address climate, which is one of the ecosystems services that our forests provide, but all the other ecosystem services our forests provide. Someone expressed a concern that the DEP was not able to provide a copy of the contract last Friday, even though the bid was won in 2018. They wanted to know what the procedure is for contract granting and how work could begin if there was not a contract, and is this an approved practice in the agency to have work begin if contracts are not finalized? So we did release that contract um, to folks that had signed up through email for the June 19th meeting. Uh, that contract uh, was not immediately released upon request. The contract included some personal information, um, phone numbers, taxpayer IDs, sometimes they have social security numbers. And so um, out of respect and out of requirements for normal FOIA requests, some of that information had to be redacted. But that since has been shared. Contract was signed uh, in 2017, 2018, and work like this would not occur on state lands without one. There was a question about the requirements of BMPs around cutting equipment and, you know, for prevention of spills and things like that. And somebody wanted to know, considering all of those requirements, why was there a plastic tub on the cutting equipment with hydraulic fluid drained from it? Drained from the cutter head. Yeah, so we, so that was interesting. There was some documentation on um, a pan that, uh, one uh, one neighbor thought there might be two cups of liquid in, um, but then that pan mysteriously was removed. We the deep hazmat uh, came out to that site, reviewed that site, and we're expecting a report probably in the next week or so. There was no finding of any spill or any concern of a spill there. Um, I would say that you know, equipment and even our own personal cars show dampness at times around fittings, and that that's kind of normal. It doesn't necessarily equate to um, any type of pollution though. Chris, maybe along those lines, you could sort of answer the next part of that question, which was how does DEP manage this contractor's adherence to environmental laws? 
Uh, that's a good one. There's um, so the contract we have uh, has many provisions, um, including spill prevention, control, and general adherence to all environmental laws. There are some broad statements in there that we can be, make very specific to the location and to the contractor itself. Um, I guess the uh, I would encourage folks if they don't have the contract, and particularly to this question, um, that they can contact me, or uh, get, and I can get them the contract, and they can look through it to see that if there are specific questions being addressed in there. Given the genetic diversity within a tree species, how do we know that selective logging will choose the trees that will lack the resistance to any future changes in climate? Well, as foresters, we're always training to the latest science and currently we're learning about carbon forestry. But we do know a lot about silvics already and we do know characteristics of trees, which trees uh, can sustain drier environments, which can sustain wetter environments, which ones are more wind resistant and based on soil type, which ones will flourish. Um, there's lots of considerations uh, in silvics and not silviculture, but silvics how trees grow in different environments and the different characteristics of trees. That is um, some basic training that all foresters have and something that we actually examine them on in order for them to be an occupational licensed person in Connecticut. It was someone that was concerned about cherry picking questions so that we aren't asking the tough questions of DEP. We've at this point got over 85 questions and we don't have enough time, unfortunately, to get through them all. That's part of why we're recording the meeting. I'm trying to select ones that are going to give a flavor of some of the different questions that people have been asking and I'll do my best to, to ask some tough ones. I think we already have asked a few of those, but I'll keep going here. If the natural thinning of the ash trees due to emerald ash trees is allowing invasive plant species, why wouldn't logging result in the same thing? So in the, in the logging, in the process of logging, we remove the, the, the trees that are causing the filtered sunlight and we allow the natural vegetation to take off to, in order to compete with the invasive species. Also, when we, after a, a work like that, we're much easier able to get into the forest and treat those invasive species. There's a question about why DEP hasn't considered any alternatives to logging the forest. Why haven't we looked at alternatives that could actually increase its scientific, biodiverse, and monetary value? Um, you know, part of that would possibly be logging half the block and leaving the other half untouched to invite science and study and to see which side benefits? So this, this topic did come up um, on our June 19th meeting and in the field. And, I, and I, although, you know, we're obviously sympathetic that there is an 80 acre piece in Simsbury currently being improved for forest health purposes, it represents, and on an annual basis, the agency itself um, affects less than 1% of all of its state forest holdings. Uh, so there's over 170,000 acres of land deemed as state forest, and there's probably about 1,000 to 1,500 acres a year that are improved th through operations like this. The remaining areas, um, they may be worked at some point, but there's an awful lot that never will be. And as we mentioned before, there's a lot of scientific collector permits already out there um, that we encourage. And, and it's particularly, I'm thinking of the Connecticut Agriculture Experiment Station that has long-term forest health plots along with the USDA Forest Service. And those areas are used for monitoring and there's, there's data available on those locations. Okay, the next question is, what's the definition of a vernal, pond, a vernal pool versus a pond? 
We haven't had much rain yet, and there's still water in the vernal pond that's there. I'll leave that one for you. I was going to say, do you want me to try and take part of that one? Yeah, vernal pools are different in ponds in part because of the species that live there and also how long the water lasts in a typical vernal pool. Usually most vernal pools will be dry or almost completely dry by August. They're designed to be fairly ephemeral. They are supporting primarily amphibians and a whole host of invertebrates. And the idea is that they typically don't sustain enough things, enough water that would support things like fish that would then eat all the amphibians. So it becomes a safe place for a lot of amphibians to breed. That's one of the distinctions in vernal pools, but it has a lot to do with what species can be supported there. There are certain species that are considered vernal pool obligates, like wood frogs, for example. Um, fairy shrimp are also another vernal pool obligate species. So it's, it's complex in terms of what it is. And, you know, some, some vernal pools will shrink in size. They'll be very large in the spring when everything is very, very wet. And this time of year, they'll still hold a little bit of water, but probably not enough to support fish. The next question is, it's been stated that it's necessary to log to free trees, to free the trees so that they can grow more quickly. Aside from the desire to harvest more timber, why are slow growing trees a problem? I wouldn't say slow growing trees are a problem in and of themselves, but you have a whole forest of slow growing trees you, you run the risk of losing that forest in one catastrophic event. And so what we try to strive for is a diversity of trees, some slow growing, some fast growing. Uh, slow growing trees, um, I'm thinking of hemlocks uh, in particular that can stand in the understory for 100 years at maybe three or four inches in diameter and then suddenly flourish if given some sunlight uh, are a great example of a really important tree to retain in some locations. Uh, slow growing trees are also denser. Um, they're, they tend to weigh more and they hold more carbon. So I wouldn't say we uh, wholeheartedly disfavor or favor one, one tree over the other, but what we're trying to strive for is the diversity in the forest. Okay, there's another question specifically for you, Chris. It says, you keep saying there's nothing to grow up from the understory. That's not true. There's a wide variety of young growth. What are you basing your statements on? So there's areas in the forest that you can walk through. There's very little tree regeneration. Um, and then what, what is growing is basically done all it's going to do without more sunlight. Uh, all the vegetation is competing for the same nutrients and water. And with less vegetation, the remaining vegetation will flourish and grow better. Okay, I'll take the next one. There's a lot of questions that are showing up about box turtle nests and shouldn't we be searching for box turtle nests as well as adult box turtles? You know, the, the interesting thing about box turtles and, and all turtles, for example, is that they lay their eggs and then they leave that area. And usually they're going to spend most of their time far away from the areas that they select to, to lay their eggs and, and have their nest. It's not a nest that's tended, it's a nest that's buried underground. They can be extremely difficult to find unless you actually see a turtle in the act of laying a nest. One of the other things about box turtle and all turtle species that make them very challenging, they're very long-lived species. They don't tend to have a lot of juvenile survivorship, so a lot of times predators will find most of those eggs and most of those nests. It's, you know, it's just one of the challenges. From a conservation standpoint, that's one of the reasons that we tend to focus on trying to protect the adult turtles because they live a very long time. They have a phenomenal reproductive capacity in that they stay able to produce eggs from about 10 years of age right up into their you know, 40s and 50s. So it, it actually has a greater conservation benefit to worry about protecting the adults than it does the eggs. Certainly if we can find a nest, we would protect it but trying to find a nest is extremely difficult unless you see them actually laying it. There's another question about, will the machine operators be responsible for locating box turtles? 
that's something that hasn't been completely decided yet. You know, it depends a little bit on how familiar some of those operators are with doing things like this. Sometimes we can enlist the help of our master wildlife conservationists to actually do those sweeps for us. So that's still something that has to be decided yet. Okay, the next question is considering climate change and our uncertain future challenges to the state forest lands, can you explain what the value of managing these forests are and why the value of having professional log and what the value of having professional loggers is and what the consequences would be if there was no management of these forests? So there's, a, there's I think there's more that we don't know about climate change than what there is that we do. And one of the recommendations of many scientific papers uh, tell us is that we need to diversify the forest in order to respond to things we don't really know that may happen. And we've had some really strange things happen in Connecticut um, recently, and that is like the introduction of the southern pine beetle, uh, a southern native pest that no one would ever think of finding in Connecticut. But we did find it in some of our most treasured ecosystems, the pitch pine forest. So. It just, it, it exemplifies the fact that we, we need to, to diversify our trees, we need to diversify our age classes in these forests, so we have a forest that can respond to the unknown. Um, we don't know what's gonna happen down the, down the line as far as new pests coming in from Asia or native pests moving up from southern states. And the, the, uh, the benefit of having professional loggers, loggers that, um, have to uh, get an occupational license in Connecticut, which is uh, fairly uncommon across the United States, is that we know that the folks that are doing this job have displayed competency through exam and through continuing education units. Uh, the operators we have in Connecticut are some of the best in the New England area. Okay, Chris, there's a question that asks, are you also harvesting the pines along the rail trail and have those trees been sold yet? That's, um, that's a detailed question. I'd refer to Will or maybe Francis Fidlio on the call. I'm not sure if they can unmute themselves. Um, we can we can get back to that question, I guess. Chris, it's Will, and uh, real quick, I'm bringing up the uh, tally sheet, and um, I do not see white pine listed on the tally sheet on this quick glance here. So, if the trees aren't don't have paint on them, then they weren't uh, marked or scheduled for removal. Yeah, so this, this may be a situation where there's that, that confusion of the management plan pertains to two locations, the Great Pond Block, which is more, more managed for pine, and then this other location, which is more suitable for oak trees. To clarify, trees along the bike trail greenway weren't marked, was actually uh, quite a buffer between the, act, the sale itself. But there were signs posted down there, so people may see the signs and think you were cutting right along the trail. Thank you, Fran. Okay, the next question is, there's plenty of existing understory in the current state. In the work done area, the diversity has been dramatically reduced, leaving only similarly aged oaks and a crushed understory. In the area beyond the logged area, there is astounding structural diversity. This active management is reducing this diversity, making the forest less resilient. Is that a statement or a question, Jenny? 
Well, it's a statement, but I think the question in there is, you know, can you explain a little bit about how the how the cut is going to look as it regenerates versus what it looks like right now? Because right, what it looks like right now is similarly aged trees and smaller trees in the understory that have been felled as the larger trees came down. So how does that structural diversity change over time is I think part of what the question gets at. So, um, and this actually is a great question because it leads to some of the discussion we've had on research and monitoring. Um, and similar work has already occurred in the Great Pond Block uh, and it wrapped up in 2018, uh, about two years ago. And folks can go down there and see the, what occurs post-harvest. And what you have is a greater diversity of undergrowth of plant species and tree species because we've had a variety of light, more light hit the forest floor. Um, you know, the, the, the statements are kind of obvious. I mean, immediately following the work or where the logs are stacked, the vegetation is, is reduced. But at the onset, when things are removed and the sunlight's back in there, it's a quick recovery and the plant species are more diverse because you have greater sunlight and less competition for the nutrients and water. The next question is, what will DEP do about deer browsing? MDC is cutting established forest only to generate stands of black birch because the deer ate all the other seedlings. Uh, let's come back to that question, Jenny. Okay. Somebody remember that one because I've got a scroll. Okay, one of our one of our phone participants asked, why was the survey done after cutting started? Isn't it supposed to happen beforehand? And Jenny, I'll, I'll let you take the lead, but it was in response to the, um, to really the unprecedented out, outreach that we received on June 19th and the questions that were asked. We wanted to be responsive. Um, and uh, the survey was one way to address some of those concerns. And I think certainly a lot of times the, the work done beforehand will be based on the best available information we have at the time a cut is getting to move forward. We obviously had some challenges with this one in terms of delayed start times and things like that. And it's certainly possible that things changed in that ensuing time period. You know, based on the feedback we were hearing from all of you, it made it seem like it was worth taking another look to see what might have changed in that time. Okay, there's a question about how this recording will become available and presented to the public. How, what information? This recording. Oh, this recording. Uh, we will, uh, I believe I'm safe in saying we will post a link to it on the deep forestry page affiliated with the forest, um, Masako forest practice page where all the other information related to the forest management plan, et cetera, is located. Does that sound reasonable, Chris? Yeah, it does. And we can, um, we can put a document together there with the uh, survey that was done, combine that. And then we can also save the chat file. Yeah, all the information that we've provided so far um, will be available in that one location, including a, the recording of this. Got another, Jenny?
Jenny, are you still there? Sorry, having problems with the mute button. <laughs> Would the DEEP be willing to meet with a town rep so they can be shown the wetlands that do exist? That area should be delineated. Yeah, um, excuse me, go ahead. What's Chris? I mean, we're happy to meet anyone out there. Um, you know, just arrange time to get together. We could walk out there and look at those wetland areas with somebody, or they can walk out there as long as there's nothing occurring that would uh, impede their safety. Um, yeah, I'll make a point of uh, visiting the site next week with someone affiliated with the town uh, to consider uh, wetlands on the property. And just for point of order, we are now about three minutes from the end of the uh, Zoom meeting. I'm sorting through the things that are comments versus questions, so bear with me here. We're getting close to the end. There was a question for Chris asking if he's actually walked the site. So I've walked um, just on that 19th. I walked in the landing area off the road. I haven't walked through that entire forest block. How many years and how many different timber sales has this forester overseen? How many of his or her timber harvests have failed to regenerate back to forest land? Well, I'm hoping Fran is still on. He can speak for himself, but uh, Fran is, uh, has well over 30 years um, experience with us as a state agency. Um, his supervisor is also on the call. So if either one want to speak to the success Fran has had, over his 30 year career, I'd be happy to let that take place. Will or Fran? Um, all those, uh, I'm actually do my speaker down here and I'll get feedback. Um, some of the sales are truly designed for regeneration and some are thinnings. This is a combination of both. Um, with the thinnings, you do get regeneration. Also, although the, not the main intent of the sale or the harvest, um, in our our forest regenerate. We don't have to plant because even talking about planting white pine in the area, uh, the the woods come back with not much help. You open the area up. Uh, hopefully, if you're time, if you're trying to get oak back, hopefully you have a, a acorn crop. Um, uh, you know, there is issues, you may get birch and maple, maybe less desirable, but um, I've had areas where we have had the oak come through also. Great, thank you, Fran. If uh, I could say one this... thing, uh, Fran Trenfridlow's had a very long career with DEP, it's very successful, and his attention to detail is, is uh, it's spot on. And I think you'll see that in the review of the wildlife survey work that was done and Fran's buffering of the wetlands that are out there. Um, Fran's done ex exemplary work and uh, throughout his entire career at DEEP. Thank you, Will. Um, and at this point, we are just coming up on seconds before eight o'clock. I did want to turn back to that question about what are we going to do about deer browse? Um, deer browse certainly is a ubiquitous problem across the state. We try to, the only, truly effective tool we have to deal with uh, overabundant deer populations are hunting seasons and uh, the use of hunters, whether they're archers or muzzleloader hunters or shotgun um, hunters. Uh, I'm not familiar with this particular block in the context of hunting. Uh, that's why I asked for a pause because I went to our 
hunting and fishing guide to, or hunting and trapping guide to see whether or not uh, Masako was listed. It's not. Uh, it says to me it's currently not open to any forms of hunting. If someone there that lives in the community knows something different, I wouldn't be shocked. I'm just telling you what I'm reading from our hunter, uh, hunting and trapping guide. Uh, I am going to go back though to our agency files to try to understand more clearly what that is. Um, and under the assumption that it is closed, that would have been predicated on a hunting review team performed on the property. And those hunting review teams look at all of our state lands in the context of what forms of hunting would be uh, safe and, uh, for both the hunters and the community around that uh, property. And like I say, all I can tell you is that from my quick perusal of the hunting and trapping guide, it doesn't list it. Uh, but hunting is the first and foremost tool we have available to us uh, in order to control localized populations. So I wish I, I had a deeper understanding of hunting at this property. Uh, that would make some people feel better, some people feel worse, uh, depending upon what the answer was, but, but that's what I know at the moment. Um, at this point, we'll close the meeting and I'm going to uh, extend the offer to Commissioner Dykes to see if she would like to close this out. Um, thanks, Rick, and, and I just want to say thanks to everyone who joined us this evening. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of questions are in the chat box. Um, hopefully we were able to uh, respond to many of them um, with the presentation that was provided as well as in the, this Q&A. Uh, but again, um, appreciate the opportunity to share with folks um, this information and, and, and as also, you know, some of the uh, uh, perspectives and, and and policy, you know, that uh, and priorities that underpin um, our forest management practices uh, for state forests across the state. And I just want to encourage folks, you know, as I know many are, are really interested in um, not just how this particular uh, uh, location is being managed and um, the best practices around um, the, the selective harvest activity that's occurring there, but also about you know, broader policy questions about these different priorities that inform um, our management practices. And I, I really do wanna encourage folks to um, consider uh, engaging uh, in those, the discussions on those policies in the context of the Forest Action Plan and the Governor's Council on Climate Change. Those are venues where um, we are engaging with broad set of stakeholders across the state um, and welcome um, many folks, not, not only uh, uh, being in dialogue with us with respect to um, Masco Block, but um, to, to uh, engage with us on, on these broader policy discussions in those venues as well. So with that, um, thank you everybody for, for joining us, us this evening. We will be posting uh, the recording um, here. It will include uh, the, the ability to see the questions um, and comments that are in the chat box and uh, I'm grateful for everyone's time. Once again, thank you everyone. Thank you.